I haven't been playing a lot of new games recently. I don't know, I guess I've just been enjoying replaying a bunch of older games and catching up with some more recent games that I never got around to playing. But I've also really gotten into hunting for glitches lately and seeing how I can exploit some errant lines of code. Let me tell ya, some games are really glitchy. Hey, no one gets to tell me how to enjoy my video games. If I want to drive around the streets of Grand Theft Auto without committing any crimes, I'll do that. If I want to do a three-heart run of a Zelda game, that'll do me nicely. If I want to time travel in Animal Crossing, I'll be going against the chilled out nature of the game and committing a war crime, but it's still my decision. It's a joke, I don't actually care what you do in Animal Crossing as long as you visit my island and leave me lots of presents, but glitches carry a certain stigma to them that is somewhat comparable. There's always been this concern that exploiting and actively hunting for glitches is to the detriment of the people who made the game, and disrespectful to the whole developmental process. I'm not going to hold myself up as some kind of holier-than-thou playtester, but all games have glitches. It's just that some have a lot more than others. Sometimes glitches become so commonplace that they act as one of the most defining characteristics of the game. You know, the sort of games where you don't need to go looking for glitches because they will find you and interrupt a standard play session with reminders that games can occasionally be so corrupted that they transcend into being something very different. I've talked about glitches in a few different videos before in pursuit of finding some of the best glitches or creepy ones or whatever, but today it's all about quantity. I want games where you can't take two steps without tripping over glitches and the slowly unraveling facade of normality. When you look at it like that, I am spoilt for choice. Mistakes have been made. When is a glitch a glitch and not just bad game design? Hard to say sometimes, and there's not always one universal definition, but I reckon you'd get some traction if you said that glitches tend to be accidental and bad game design has a bit more thought put into it. Good game design can fall foul of a few glitches that may taint the experience enough to convince someone that it's actually bad game design, and this is most of the reason why I'm starting off by talking about the first gen of Pokemon. Red, blue, and sometimes yellow are an absolute state, with a list of glitches longer than your arm, and it says a lot about the condition that these games were left in when Game Freak decided to fix most of these problems in the next generation. The thing is that when you dissect these games and look through them with a fine tooth comb to see what the problems are, a lot of them come out as oversights rather than code not working properly. But also these games have missing though, so there's plenty wrong too. If you're confused by what I mean by oversights versus glitches, consider the fact that the psychic type is incredibly overpowered in the first gen. It hasn't got many counters, and the few that it has are pretty weak. The ghost type is supposed to be strong against it, I think. It was it was strong against it in later gens, but was that the design decision at the time? Or was it a glitch? Was it supposed to be super effective, but the glitch meant that it didn't even do anything? There's stuff like this all throughout this game, but fortunately for me, it's also incredibly glitchy all the way through as well. The reality is that there's so much wrong with the first gen of Pokemon that you'd assume that half of the faults come from glitches. The story goes that Game Freak had big plans for Pokemon but were restricted by the shackles of the hardware they were given, and so had to cut corners to fit their ambitious RPG on one Game Boy cartridge. Obviously, they should be heralded for their work and especially for the updates that have followed Pokemon through its life, but it is fun to look into the numerous ways you can destroy the first gen of Pokemon. Missing No is the big one, where the game lacks the necessary checks to ensure that talking to the tutorial old man and surfing near Cinnabar Island doesn't trigger an encounter with an unidentical Pokemon. Gen 1 has exactly one check, and that's to make sure that your money doesn't underflow, which is another way of saying that having a ridiculously high amount of money isn't okay. But this? Yeah, this is okay. It's fine that you can leave Gen 1 looking like a garbled mess of sprites because your money is safe and secure and that's all that counts, right? Gen 2 had your mum take care of your cash, so clearly Game Freak had some weird priorities with your money. Some days you just need to stare into the void and see what stares back. I've often wondered if we enjoy glitches too much. I know we like it when the thin veneer that separates a game from its development is shattered and raw lines of code are spilt over what was once a, a regular video game, but I do wonder if that's exploitative of the people behind the game and the people who made the coding for the game. There are more than one side to every story. 
I don't think we should feel bad for finding glitches though. If anything, it can be really enlightening to see the inner workings of a game in a kind of how it's made sort of way that may influence budding players to get more involved in game development. It's like watching a really bad film. When you're able to identify how and why things have gone wrong, it becomes surprisingly attainable to do the right things in the right way. Anyone who has any interest in game design needs to play Big Rigs Over the Road Racing, a game commissioned on the cheap by some Californians for some Ukrainians using an engine that they found down the back of the sofa. It's a game made by inexperienced developers on a tiny budget for a company whose list of games is a sorry sight to behold. Of course it doesn't work properly. Expectations should always be low when approaching big rigs for the first time. I mean, it looks like a racing game and sometimes sounds like a racing game, but it lacks more than a few fundamental features that would elevate it to the coveted status of functional video game. The fun part is exactly how these faults manifest themselves, since the things that are wrong with big rigs are fairly major, like no collision detection with anything except for terrain so you can drive through buildings and bridges like they're not even there, or how about the game engine not having any way of simulating inclines on the terrain so you drive everywhere at full speed, sometimes faster uphill. The best glitch though is what happens if you stay in reverse for long enough because for some reason Big Rigs lets you accelerate indefinitely while reversing up to a max speed of 12.3 undecillion miles per hour which is 10 to the 28 times the speed of light and fast enough to travel the entire observable universe in the blink of an eye and effectively be in every location in the universe at once. Big Rigs has many qualities and is a surprisingly enjoyable game to mess around in, but I never expected it to have omnipotence on a scale like this. Somehow, this game is able to support faster than light travel, but crashes if you try to load two out of the five available tracks. I wish we had more games like it. Bethesda games are a big collection of glitches pretending to be a video game. It's kind of incredible how this isn't much of an exaggeration since Bethesda has done nothing but enhance their notoriety for haphazard game development that fills a game of ideas and scenarios without any real motivation to tie them together. This is especially noticeable when they're open world games where Bethesda thinks big and ambitious and Todd Howard runs around clutching his penis as he gets all excited about the size of the world that they're going to end up with. But obviously, stretching a flimsy concept across a wide open landscape is just a breeding ground for all sorts of bugs and glitches. You need to be careful and do a lot of bug testing, otherwise it's going to be a disaster. Fallout 76 was where the malformed chickens came home to roost as it became obvious that not only are Bethesda not able to expand their basic game loop across a large overworld without the fabric of reality collapsing in of itself, but also that any goodwill that they may have built up over the years has long since run dry. We made allowances for previous games being a bit buggy because it was part of the Bethesda charm. There's nothing charming about Fallout 76. Which I feel is very significant because you could quite clearly make the argument that every other game in this video is horrendously glitchy in an enjoyable way. Yeah, it's a mess, but it's a characterful mess that someone might reasonably seek out and experience for themselves. Fallout 76, from top to bottom, isn't an experience that I'd wish on my worst enemy, since while the glitches are plentiful and are obstructive enough to be a worthwhile contender for this video, Fallout 76 is altogether more cynical and more representative of the mad rush to cobble together half a video game under a recognisable name and not much else. This game wasn't playtested or stress tested or at least any glitches that were found weren't reported or fixed before release, which was a disastrous time for Bethesda where players were rightly angry that $60 bought them a video game that is barely functional. Even when it did function, there's just so much wrong here that it often doesn't resemble the online Fallout game that many signed up for and merely stands as the straw that broke the camel's back. The game that tipped people over the edge on Bethesda and their lackadaisical approach to bug fixes. I know this video is meant to highlight how broken some games can get, but Fallout 76 is an indication of how morally bankrupt some studios can become over time. I'm still not sure this game is working as intended 18 months later, and frankly, I couldn't give a damn. I'm sure the sixth Elder Scrolls game will be a hoot. Typically, there's one major reason why a game ends up really broken. 
Developers and programmers for any of the major studios are usually competent enough to make a game without too many coding errors, and so it falls to a rushed development cycle to disrupt standard practices and bring home decades worth of infamy and some of those diabolically low review scores. You pick any terrible game from an otherwise well respected series of games, and there's a very good chance that those working on the game would be able to tell stories of having too much to do and rapidly approaching deadlines. I'm not 100% sure who's to blame when it comes to Sonic the Hedgehog 2006 being squeezed out before it was anywhere close to being finished, but I do know that it was probably that bitch Carol fucking Baskin. This was a good decade before she fed her husband to the Tigers, so she was clearly leading to something, but the end result of Sonic 06 mismanagement is incredibly interesting to unpack and witness in action. Oh, Sonic, you have fallen so far. Sonic has had a rocky history, but it's hard to ascertain the point in time where everything started to unravel. You could blame Sonic Adventure for being so janky, or Shadow the Hedgehog for turning the series into a laughing stock. Maybe Sonic Boom for failing to really capitalize on some positive feedback from the game and falling back into the same hole. In reality though, the choice is obvious, and like many things in life, it always comes down to Sonic 06. Sonic 06 is a wild ride. You can watch videos online about it and read reviews until your eyes are pointing in different directions, but nothing can ever adequately prepare you for the sheer scale of train wreck that Sonic 06 resembles. Not just in a, hey, this game was rushed and is ran full of glitches kind of way, but some of the creative decisions are absolutely baffling. Yeah, there's 101 ways to break and exploit every small facet of Sonic 06, but not having enough time is a poor excuse for a hilariously complicated story and terrible voice acting performances. We're here for the glitches though, and if that's the barometer by which we measure success, then Sonic 06 is one of the best games ever made! Nearly every object can interact with every other object in such a way that the game's physics engine can't quite comprehend, and the results are some spectacular displays of a game not quite understanding what's happening to itself. Press the right buttons in the right place and you can make just about anything happen, including triggering a special message that will tell you if you're enjoying this video and want to see more, make sure to subscribe and click the bell for notifications of new videos. There's a way of warping to the credits in Sonic's story before you enter White Acropolis, which skips about 80% of his campaign. That's a bit silly, come on. It's great for speedrunners, but the average player will probably want to play these levels and steadily become more incredulous as the glitches consume any hope you had of a normal playthrough. You never forget your first time with Sonic. Logic dictates that newer games have fewer glitches in them. I suppose modern games have more to them, and therefore more components that can go horribly wrong, but we've also got dev teams in the hundreds with so many safeguards in place to make sure that a game isn't released in a horribly unfinished state. These days we have patches that can be downloaded sometime after release to freshen up some of the more offensive problems, but clearly these weren't available in the 90s and especially not to creators of unlicensed cartridges filled with lots of broken unfinished games. Yeah, we're finishing the video off strong because while Sonic 06 is a drunken mistake that smells of misplaced ambition and regret, Action 52 is a whole different ball game. Except the ball is a lopsided square and no one had enough time to finish it. Not a scam though, that's important to establish. Creator Vince Perry may have been exceedingly overambitious and didn't really know what he was doing, hence why he decided to charge close to $200 for the privilege of 52 games that don't work so well, but these faults came from incompetence rather than any malicious intent. Perry had no idea how long it takes to make the average video game, so when he set out with 52 times the workload, the inevitable outcome is that every game on here has at least one major glitch. Most of these games aren't beatable, a fact made more embarrassing considering that the devs ran a contest for anyone who could beat level 5 of the ooze to be entered into a prize draw for over $100,000, except the game would crash on level 2, meaning that no one was even entered for the draw. These glitches maybe aren't as fun as others in this video, but they do stop you from playing lots of games, which I would say makes Action 52 the glitchiest game around. Or at least until Fallout 76 gets a new update. Enjoy it while it lasts. This is Rabbit Luigi, and Action 52 was only made because Perry wanted to create a good functional version of those bootleg cartridges that are full of crappy ROMs that come out of China. But actually, in reality, we have two giant dollops of hilarious irony, because 
Action 52 is now one of the most famous unlicensed cartridges ever made. It's made history because it was so bad. But also, the bootleg scene in China has not changed. If anything, it's got more popular. So Action 52 has made history, even though it did the opposite of what it set out to do. You don't even have to try anymore. Why would I even try? The developers of these games didn't really know what they were doing for the most part, which incidentally is the same amount of experience I had with web design. That is, before I signed up to Squarespace and soaked up all they had to offer me in terms of expertise and sleek templates that can help you to make the website of your dreams. It worked with me and I used their intuitive tools and wide range of designs to help me with my website so I can finally tell people what I think of the Resident Evil 3 remake in online review form. Squarespace is especially useful since if all this feels too overwhelming, you can quite easily use their vast array of tutorials to help you understand how to do a specific thing, like having a video as the background for your site. So if you're ready to share your passion or just your opinion with the world, with a service that is willing to help you every step of the way, head on over to squarespace.com for a 14 day free trial, and when you're ready to get going for real, go to squarespace.com forward slash rabbitluigi for 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Share your talent with the world with Squarespace today.